Well, good evening, everyone. We might get started. Thank you so much for coming on this very rainy night. Um, I was saying if it was me and I was at home and I had my slippers on, I don't think I'd be wanting to come out again, but you have, so thank you so much. And thank you for supporting uh, the parent seminars that we run, we run here at PLC. Well, we're going to talk on a subject, I think, that impacts every single one of us. And the reason it is because apart from the time when we take that quick holiday by the pool somewhere in Queensland or in Fiji or in Bali, if we're lucky, and when we're too tired to think about anything, most of the time we're busy, all the time. I found this. Just have a look. Is that how you feel? <laughs> yeah. Busy has become a bit of an excuse, hasn't it? So nowadays, when someone asks the question, how are you, often you get the answer, really busy. It seems that busyness is now viewed as a modern life expectation on all of us. After all, there is no doubt that life has become more complex. We have more things to manage in our lives. We are working more. There are more demands to keep with, up with our social life and our material possessions and our financial circumstances and for our girls, their education. And often this is all through technology, which we access every waking moment of our lives. We like to keep our children busy. We don't like to give them too much time to be lazy or to get into trouble. So being, is a, being busy is a good thing, isn't it? Well, sometimes it is. But most of the time, being busy just doesn't feel right. I saw this video a few months ago, which you will probably re relate to. Watch it and see if this represents your weekend. There's an art to what I'm doing. It may not look like much, but that's precisely the point. I've mastered the art of mm, guilt-free relaxation. While their weekends involve running around in a frantic state, or what they like to call being productive, mine looks a little like this. A bit of this, and maybe a little of this. Take a page out of my book. Make a little time for yourself this weekend. Because the best time to relax is when you feel like there's no time at all. Take back the weekend, people. Okay, so who do you identify with in that video? For all of us, I think a busy life often feels slightly out of control. It feels a bit frantic, often ineffective, stressful and exhausting. A busy life leads to jaw clenching. Does anyone do that? And brow furrowing. And often our lives are measured by how much we get done. A busy life is all about piling it on, catching up, falling behind, and often waking up too tired to do it all over again. There are only 24 hours in a day, so what can we do about busyness? Well, perhaps there is nothing that we can do about the tasks that we have to complete on any given day. We may not be able to reduce what is on our to-do list or in our weekly diary. And we may even enjoy being busy. But if busy life distracts you from what you really care about and who you really are, then I think we should try to address busyness. And I hope tonight that we can give you some of the strategies to help you, or at least some ideas to take away with you. And you will hear from four 
PLC staff members tonight who have considered this issue of busyness. So after I've offered some tips, Mr Chris Morphew, our junior school Christian studies teacher, will talk to you about his journey and response to busyness. Next, you will hear from Mrs Lynn Knapman, who will talk to you about some of the ways that you can help your daughters manage the many, many activities that she likes to be involved in here at PLC Sydney. And finally, we'll hear from our wise chaplain, Mrs Cassandra Morphew, who will talk to you about the ways that she has found herself to best address business in her life. So to begin, I would like to suggest that perhaps one way of doing away with busyness is to first change the way we think about it. Would it be more useful to refer to our lives as being full rather than being busy? Because a full life feels healthy and happy and contented. It has meaning and purpose. It engages us in what we care most deeply about. And most importantly, a full life feels like growth. And when we live a full life, we smile and we breathe deeply. We feel connected to our family and friends and we feel deeply satisfied at the end of each day, anticipating the next. So, how is life for you right now? Does your life feel busy or does it feel full? If your life feels busy rather than full, I'd like to move on to some tips about making your life full rather than busy. So my first strategy is to find enough time to rest and sleep. The first casualty of a busy life is often to forgo rest and sleep. And this particularly applies to our students and perhaps parents as well if they are working and have lots of deadlines. But in order to live a full, contented, happy life, foregoing sleep and rest is probably the worst thing that you can do. It is certainly the worst thing to do if you want to maintain good well-being and mental health. Because the research on sleep is very powerful. Lack of sleep has a huge impact on our mental and physical health and on our cognitive ability. Sleep disruption or lack of sleep affects the neurotransmitters that build connections in our brain. And it also affects the level of cortisol that we produce. And therefore, lack of sleep is linked to poor academic achievement and is strongly linked to increased anxiety, depression, and even more serious mental health issues. So sleep is very important to all of us, but particularly for children and teenagers. Children and teenagers should be getting approximately eight and a half hours to nine hours sleep per night. But most teenagers do not get enough sleep. They have poor sleep patterns. They tend to stay up late on school nights to get work done, and then they sleep in on weekends, which impacts their circadian rhythm and further impacts the quality of their sleep it becomes a vicious cycle. So, what can you do to improve the quality of your sleep? The first thing is to have a regular bedtime and wake-up time, even on weekends. That's hard for teenagers. Have a wind-down time each night before bedtime, ideally an hour, and create a relaxation uh, routine that will induce sleepiness. You need to turn off all your electronic devices that may interrupt you during the night. Another tip for teenagers, don't use your bedroom for study. It's a distraction and it takes away your ability to go to sleep. Build some physical activity into your day which will help you fall asleep faster and help you spend more time in a deep sleep. 
And if you find it hard to sleep, use some relaxation techniques, such as guided imagery, deep breathing, or progressive muscle relaxation. My second suggestion is to take time out for the things that you value. So to use some familiar business jargon, it means scheduling hard stops into your day. This means that you need to ensure that you... Sorry, my, my son has just called me. There you go. That's busyness, isn't it? This means that you need to ensure that you make time in your day to do the things that you value. Make these events a priority and do not compromise them. So what are the things that you value most in your day? For instance, it might be eating dinner with your family at 7pm each weeknight. It might be getting to your yoga class on a Wednesday night. It might be spending time praying and reading your Bible each morning or going to church on Saturday night. It might be going to that fitness class on a Tuesday. Whatever it might be, don't let other busy activities get in the way. Make these times a no compromise zone. My third tip is to find time for wide spaces. So as well as prioritising hard stops in your day, also find time to slow down and stay in the moment. This might involve taking in a morning sunrise if you get up early or finding 10 minutes to have that cup of coffee with a friend, or sitting and listening in stillness to your favourite piece of music, or reading that novel that you are keen to get to. Finding time each day to do the things that bring you joy is important. These might be only small things, but by doing them, you bring meaning and purpose to your day every day. And finally, my last tip is to practice self-compassion. Self-compassion is about offering the same kindness to yourself as you would to your friends. It is accepting that we all have imperfections and that it is okay to not get things right all the time. Self-compassion is about understanding that striving for perfection or covering up our imperfections can be damaging to our soul. The best way to do self-compassion, therefore, is to acknowledge our weaknesses and cultivate vulnerability, the ability to risk being hurt. There is a great TED talk by Brenine Brown on vulnerability, and I uh, would like you to explore that in your own time. To practice self-compassion means that we don't compare our achievements to others. We do not define ourselves by what we do, but how we do things. If we focus on how we live our lives and not on the what of our lives, then we may find that our lives become more fulfilling and more meaningful. It might begin to feel full rather than feeling busy. So to sum up, my four tips are Get enough quality sleep. Make sure you have scheduled the hard stops into your day and don't compromise on them. Find time for wide spaces where you take in the moments that you enjoy and practice vulnerability and self-compassion. So these are my small tips on how we can combat busyness in our lives and I hope you find them helpful and I'll now pass over to Mr Morphew. Hey guys. So it, it's funny the things you pick up from your parents. Uh, here's a picture of my family quite some time ago. My dad's influence on my life is pretty easy to spot. Here's a picture of my dad circa 1991, dancing like a monkey in front of a crowd of small children. And 25 years later, this has turned out to be a surprisingly large component of my work here at PLC. Uh, my mum's influence, though, is a little bit more difficult to spot. Uh, I mean, for one thing, there's the hair, um, although reports vary on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, uh, there was this one time I was driving home from school and a junior school mum pulled up at the traffic lights next to me and she wound down her window and she said, Mr. Morphew, your hair is wasted on a man. 
and then she drove off. And so, I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Um, anyway, thankfully, that's not the only thing I've inherited from my mother. Um, there are a couple of others that come to mind. My mum is an overcommitter. Well, some would just say committer, but I would maybe suggest overcommitter. When she sees a need or when she's asked to do something, more often than not, far more often than not, her answer is yes, because someone's got to do it, right? Uh, she also has a pretty rampant perfectionist streak, because why get it right when you could get it just right? You know what I mean? And over the course of my life, I found that these attitudes have become deeply embedded in me as well. For example, I spent a fair bit more time than I really want to admit, finding, trying to find like the exactly right picture of a pencil to go up on the slide there. And I'm still not entirely happy. You can't really see it on the screen, but the white of the image doesn't quite match the white of the background. It was quite distressing for me. Anyway, um, I mention all of this not to turn tonight into my own like personal therapy session, but to point out that as I spend the next few minutes talking to you guys about rest, I'm not coming to you guys as an expert. I'm coming to you as, well, when you combine a habit of overcommitment and a perfectionist streak and a career like teaching, the results can get pretty messy. But I have been thinking this year about how I can do rest better. And hopefully some of what's been helpful to me will also be helpful to you. Because I have a feeling that struggling to find a healthy balance between work and rest isn't just a me thing. We live in a time and a culture with so many opportunities, so many obligations, so many good things to do, so many ways to fill our time, almost all of us have too much on. And I think almost all of us live with this constant sense of how in the world am I going to get all of this done? All of which means that rest is hard. It's harder than ever. But I'm at the same time more convinced than ever that rest is really, really important. Rest matters. And as I've been struggling with how do I integrate rest into my busy life, one idea that I found really helpful is the biblical concept of Sabbath. Now, Sabbath is basically the idea of taking a weekly day of rest. And the practice was first introduced as one of the Ten Commandments that God gave to his people after he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, which is kind of weird on the face of it, right? Like it's an odd thing to make an order. Thou shalt not work Saturdays. But I think it makes a whole lot more sense when you consider the context. Because who were the original recipients of this rule? They were an entire race of people who had just been released from slavery. They were a people group who for generations had known nothing but work, who for generations had been told that the entirety of their value and worth was based on what they could achieve and produce and do. So for the original hearers of this, this command, the Sabbath was a weekly reminder that they were more than this. It was a reminder that their value did not depend on what they did, but on who they were. Treasured children made in the image of a gracious and loving God. In the biblical understanding, the call to rest is a call to freedom. The call to rest is a call to remember who we really are. For those people back then, it was a reminder that they desperately needed, and I think that probably they weren't the only ones. Well, okay, cool, that sounds great, Chris, but how in the world do we actually do this, right? Like, with the endless onslaught of things to do, how do we actually take the time, find the time to stop and rest? Well, like I said, I'm no expert, but earlier this year, I came across a fantastic little book called Design Your Day, and the thing I particularly love about it is how short it is, because, side note, um, how many, have you noticed how many product, productivity books are like 400 pages long? If you take 400 pages to teach me how to be efficient, it's possible that I'm not the one with the problem, I think. But as you can see, this one's tiny. I read this one in like an hour, and I, I picked up a whole bunch of really helpful tips for navigating my own business. By the way, and this is not like a paid product placement or whatever, but we do have some copies of this book available down the front for 10 bucks. Um, and there's also the iBook version, which I think is about $7, and it's definitely worth it. Um, in the meantime, here's a few quick highlights. First, spending more time working does not equal getting more done. It can be so tempting to believe the lie that we just don't have time to take a break, and that if we just stay up that extra hour, we'll finally get on top of our to-do list. I know that I fall into this trap over and over again, but in fact, all the research seems to suggest that the most productive people are the people that take time to rest and recharge, and that when they do that, they end up being more productive, not less, and the key to productivity is actually in limiting the time that we spend on work. Design Your Day talks a lot about something called the 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle says that we accomplish 80% of our work in 20% of our time. Conversely, we spend 80% of our time spinning our wheels to get a measly 20% of our results. The implication here is that it's possible to significantly edit down the amount of time you spend on work 
without editing down the amount of work that you actually get done, which sounds great, right? So how do we do it? Well, I found that a really helpful question to ask when I'm looking at all the things that I need to get done is how switched on do I actually need to be for this job? Is this a high focus job or a low focus job? And if it's a high focus job, something that needs a lot of energy and attention, when in the day am I actually gonna have that level of sustained energy and attention? For me, for example, the hours between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. tend to be seriously unproductive. By this time on most afternoons, I've just finished up a busy day of school and my brain just goes on strike. And for a few hours, there's just nothing happening. My afternoons are a great time for me to do some photocopying or apply to a few emails, but they're a terrible time for me to do anything mentally taxing. If I sit down at my desk in the afternoon and try to, say, plan out a 10-minute presentation on work and rest, what should be an hour's work turns into a whole afternoon because I just don't have my head in the game. By the way, that's not a hypothetical scenario. As I said, I'm still learning. On the flip side, I'm generally pretty good later at night or first thing in the morning. And so if I set aside that time to work on high focus jobs, I can get a whole lot more done in a fraction of the time. For you, it might be the complete opposite. The point is learn when you're most productive and learn when you're the least productive and then try and like structure your day so that you're doing your high focus jobs when you've got the energy and your low focus jobs when you don't. Another really important principle in all of this, and Linda has already touched on it, is work when you're working and rest when you're resting. It's so easy to let our work time bleed into our rest time and vice versa. We answer emails on our phone while we're having dinner or do our homework in front of the TV or take that accidental 45 minute break from that report we're meant to be writing to check Facebook and catch up on our Snapchat stories and refresh Instagram and watch that YouTube video and and everything kind of bleeds together and then the night is gone somehow. We don't work well because we're always distracted and we don't rest well because we're always catching up on work. And so if one of the most helpful changes that I've been trying to make this year is to draw some hard lines between work time and rest time. For me, that's meant things like switching off email notifications and on my phone and, and not having the Facebook tab blinking at me while I'm meant to be working because I find that the more I actually work when I'm working, the more I'm able to rest when I'm resting. So anyway, for more tips like this, there's that book. Okay, so real quick, just to finish, it, finish up, what does this Sabbath thing actually look like? Like what am I actually doing during this mythical rest time that I'm advocating here? Well, an author I like called Tim Keller says that quality rest involves three main elements. The first is reflection which for me is deeply tied up in my Christian faith. Part of breaking the cycle of relentless busyness is taking the time to stop and to just like remind myself who I am, to remind myself that my value and worth are not fundamentally determined by the good things that I achieve, but by who I am in Jesus. So for me, this means spending time in Bible reading and prayer. It means zooming out from the treadmill of the everyday and reminding myself that I am known and loved, and that my little life is part of a story that's much, much bigger than me. Uh, the second element of quality rest is fun. It's taking the time to do stuff that I enjoy, whether or not that stuff is productive. My Saturdays are the times when I give myself permission to lie in bed and read, or to catch up on TV, or to invite some mates over to play Mario Kart all afternoon, even though I'm a grown man and should probably know better. But these are the things that are fun to do. And it's like, even and when there's that little voice saying, Mr. Morphy, you're 31 and you're playing video games. It's Saturday, I'm allowed, it's fine. It's my rest day and that's fun for me. Um, and the third element, and probably the hardest, is silence and solitude. In our incredibly noisy, incredibly interconnected world, it's harder than ever to just stop and be still. It's harder to find the time for it, and it's, I find really hard to just even do it when I've got the time. It's so easy for us to just relentlessly keep going with life without ever stopping and taking stock of what's going on on the inside. One of the most powerful things we can do is to take some time, even just 10 or 15 minutes, and give ourselves the space to think whatever we happen to think, and to feel whatever we haven't had time to feel, to be quiet and still, and to just let whatever comes up come up, to take stock of how we're going. Because our lives are so busy, they're so scheduled, but in the middle of it all, I'm discovering that ironically, the key to beginning to get my head above water is to actually schedule one more thing into my diary. And that one more thing is nothing, like literally nothing. I have actually started blocking out slabs of time in my diary and writing nothing in big letters as a reminder to myself that taking the time to just step off that treadmill and rest is just as important and deserves just as much priority as anything else that I might bother to write down in my diary. For the longest time, the attitude that I've had to rest was I'll rest 
when the important work is finished. You know, I've got stuff to do. I don't have time to rest. But I'm finally starting to realize what a joke this line of thinking is because the important work is never finished. There's always more to do. There's always more important stuff that I could be doing. There's always more good to do in the world. And so more and more, I'm trying to have the attitude that I don't rest because the important work is finished. I rest because the important work is never finished and I want to have the energy to do it well. And so, I don't know. Like I said, I'm still very much on the journey here. It, most people who know me would think it was very ironic that I was coming up here to teach you all about, about how to rest because I'm not actually very good at it. But I'm getting there and hopefully um, some of what I said tonight will help you guys take some of those first steps too. Thanks. Hi, my name's uh, Lynn Knappman and uh, my role here is Director of Co-Curricular and Academic Support. I've actually been asked to talk to you about managing co-curricular programs and academic demands. So I think at first we might actually take a look at the variety of co-curricular activities that the girls tend to do and the categories that they fall into. So basically three main levels, the girls that do no co-curricular activities, which is a bit of a shame, girls that do about one to three, and then there's a very large proportion of the girls at PLC who have a very heavy co-curricular program. And in that, there are two kinds of um, girls. One, that they have a very diverse range of co-curricular activities. And a girl in this category might have one or two music ensembles. She might play a sport every term. And, um, uh, you know, as well as joining a few clubs. So that's quite a commitment. And then the second um, membership is the girls that have a single co-curricular focus. So they might have swimming or they might even do co-curricular activities that are actually external to school. So a lot of girls do dance, huge commitment in dance. We have quite a few golfers. Um, swimming's a big thing at PLC. And generally it's the last category that need to juggle their academic um, sort of work with their co-curricular and they're the ones that have the most difficulty. So if we have a look, no co-curricular, Curricula, no co-curricular activity at all. If you're in this category or your daughter's in this category and you're thinking, and isn't that lucky because I couldn't fit another thing in, I'd like you to rethink it because there's so much to be learnt about um, your co-curricular, like from co-curriculars. They make new friends, they, they, you know, learn new skills. There are plenty of activities in our co-curricular book ranging from robotics, which is just about to be put in, to cryptic crossword clubs, all the music ensembles, all sorts of things. There's absolutely going to be something in that booklet that your daughter could actually join. And some of those uh, activities are wholly contained in the school day. So they won't actually impact on your family life. They won't impact on their academic work. It might just be a 20 minute club once a week, right? Or it might be drama club at lunchtime on Monday. So if your daughter doesn't do any co-curricular activity, I'd recommend that you look through the co-curricular booklet with her and see what she can pick out, especially if she's new to the school or in year seven. Okay, the second little group of girls, you know, just a few co-curricular activities. I guess my advice to you would be know what they are, when they are, and actually what's required. Like, do they actually need any equipment? Do they need a drama costume? And I think talking to them about their co-curricular activities is actually really important because then your household is better able to deal with those commitments. I, as a parent, used to feel like an absolute failure if my child went off without their musical instrument or whatever. I was thinking, oh, no, we're falling apart. So if you actually communicate those things with your child, you'll get a lot more out of it. So now comes the big group. So, two sorts. You, if you have a lot of co-curricular activities, you need to actually try to predict when the periods are very busy, when there's a peak period, there might be a competition or there might be a speech exam coming up, and when there are clashes. Now, the girls, if they do have a clash, one that's quite common is rowing and music, and the girls get very stressed about 
a clash because they don't really want to upset either the rowing person or the music person and they know that both of them really want them to be there. Um, so generally that's pretty easy to work around. There's some solution that can be found um, and if your daughter can't manage it herself, I would actually personally try and get her to do that herself. Even if you just rehearse what she's going to say to those people. So you might say to her, you need to go and see Miss Harden. What are you going to say when you see Miss Harden? And actually do a little role play so that she's actually well prepared to do it. And if that fails, you can always do it again. But in the first instance, I can't recommend highly enough that she actually tries to deal with that sort of thing herself. Now for these um, students, we actually have a program at school School called Talented Individual Program, so it's called TIP. Primarily the girls that are in it are the girls that have a single focus co-curricula, so they might be an elite musician, an elite swimmer, we've had someone that's done acting before, all sorts of different kind of people in there, and it's a different program for different students because they all have different requirements. Um, so if your daughter is one of these ones that are finding it difficult to manage all her co-curriculars, I would suggest that you actually at least make sure her head of year knows that she's that busy. Um, but I would, again, encourage her to tell her head of year. Um, and if you think that she is uh, a TIP candidate, then by all means you can contact me. The, um, the girls in this category often have difficulty completing their homework on an ongoing basis. They might have training until 8.30 at night, so by the time they get home, they have a shower, they have the dinner, it's effectively bedtime. But instead, often they do try and stay up late because they're good girls. They don't want to disappoint anyone. And so they just keep going and going. Um, if you let the people know, then they can actually, like we can tell the staff, it's okay, she's never going to do a homework on a Monday night because she doesn't get home until 10 or she doesn't get home until 8.30. But again, your daughter actually needs to speak up and you need to encourage her to do that. And if she can't manage it, then by all means, you need to inform us. So what can we do to help? Okay, so these are my lists. This is my list. So I personally think organisation is the key, all right? Your daughter needs to use her handbook incredibly well. And that goes for everyone. So all of these tips, even if your child isn't one of those ones that are maxed out on co-curriculars, all of these things will actually help your daughter to manage their homework. So handbook absolutely needs to be used. It's a secret to success in high school, I think. They need to write every single piece of homework down. It's the only way you know that they, like, the student knows they've got it. Yes, they might remember it if they haven't written it down, but chances are not necessarily at the appropriate time. So use the handbook properly, cross it off when it's done. And so that way you know if there's anything, or she knows if there's anything outstanding. All right, so check a handbook regularly. There's actually a space in it for a parent's signature, which the kids don't like because really they feel it's their book. But there is a space for a parent signature, so you're well within your rights to ask to see it. But treat it as a conversation, basically. So, and check that they're making good choices when they actually prioritise their homework. You know, are they doing maths, English, science first? Because they're the core subjects. And then start to think about what else you need to do. I personally think I'm a maths teacher, so I think they need to do a tiny weeny little bit of maths every night. And the reason is, mostly for maths, today's work requires knowledge from yesterday. And if they don't, haven't done anything, then it leaves them at a bit of a loss today. Um, but that's absolutely my bias, <laughs> okay? Um, good communication will help. Well, um, in my family, I have quite a diverse family. One of them was an elite gymnast. So when we picked her up, she would finish at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night here. On the way home, we would actually discuss with her what she had to do when she got home. So we would actually go through the list of homework. We'd also talk about any other thing that she had to get ready. Maybe she had to get some 
costume ready for a play or whatever. We'd discuss all of that on the way home. It was about a half hour drive. So by the time she got home, she actually knew what she was going to be doing and almost in what order. So it was pretty structured, pretty well supported, but she didn't have long between arriving home and going to bed. And so she had to maximise what she could get done in that time. And she learned to work very efficiently because she didn't have actually that much time. But we would specifically ask her what she would do and then what she would do next, and it would almost take the whole car trip. Um, I think timing your homework is actually really important too, and I think it's really important for everyone. When the kids come here in year seven, they get a, what they think is quite a lot of homework, and it is quite a lot of homework. And you get the child that takes about mm, four hours to do what is one and a half hours worth of work. And while when they're in year seven, that doesn't really matter, I guess, except it's, in my opinion, a bit of a waste of time because they could be doing something good in the other two and a half hours, I think it actually sets up bad habits because they learn to do those things slowly. And inefficiency is actually rarely something that's valued. And that's basically what it is. So if they think about how long each task should take them in their homework and actually stick to it, um, then you'll, they'll actually build good working habits and, and good skills for later on. Because eventually the workload is so heavy, they can't just take forever to do each task. There's not enough time in the day. So the next thing is look ahead and, um, at your daughter's co-curricular demands, and in fact, any demands, because there may be things that are coming up that will clash. Encourage her to look ahead as well. How do they fit in with school? Like, is there a competition coming up that will result in an absence from school? P.S. If there is a competition coming up where you're going to be absent from school, if you could contact me so I could send you the exemption form, that would be great. Um, you know, how will she catch up the work? What will she miss? Can she do it before she goes? Does she have to sit the exam that she's going to miss? All of those sorts of things we can certainly help with those questions. Like, they're not that difficult. Um, the next one about working efficiently in class, if your child is busy outside of school, then they need to max out in school. So they need to be efficient in the classroom. So while everybody else is just, you know, waiting for the teacher to arrive, what you often see is the girls in tip madly trying to finish off their work, possibly from the night before, but making use of that time. So if your daughter is time poor, efficient use in the classroom is really important and because it will reduce the amount of homework she has. Ask her who she sits next to. Is it the most talkative person in class, in the year group? If so, maybe she'd be wise to move. The next one is the phone and the social media and I promise we did not actually consult on any of this, not on the sleep or the social media. Um, I think you should make sure that your daughter is not distracted by her phone or her whatever. For me, I train a lot in the afternoon and my coach sends me my training program every day by email or text or whatever. Every day I print it out on a piece of paper and go in like an old fuddy-duddy into the gym with my little piece of paper. And the reason I do that is because if I access my phone, I'm distracted by Facebook and then I just check my emails and look what's happening on Instagram and all of those things and it just takes me so much longer and I'm home late enough and so that's my way to trim that down. And the same thing happens to your daughters. I'm sure they're going to say to you, no, no, I'm not distracted. One of my sons always had his girlfriend on Skype in, up on, in his bedroom, which was a bit tricky at first because I didn't actually realise. And so I would go in in my pyjamas and all that sort of stuff and start talking to him and there she would be, hanging in the corner. Um, so try to work out a way that, you, that works in your household and get rid of that stuff while they're doing their work. It's so much more efficient to actually be focused on your work at the time. And then the bedtime. I personally think Every child should have a curfew. If you let them go, they will just stay up until they, I don't know, whatever they think they're going to do, okay? If you set a curfew, for me, when my, I have four children, um, 
And 11, when they were in year 12, 11 o'clock was their curfew. They did not stay up past 11. Tough luck, you had to have it done by 11. And the thing is, if you prioritise your homework and get it done in order of most important to least important, the things that you're going to bed not having done are the trivial things. And it's surprising how many of those can just slide by and it doesn't really matter. You think it's really important, but it'll actually be fine. So the least important homework is the thing that's outstanding. And the last thing is if your daughter can see that she'll have difficulty handing in her assignment or getting her work due, basically because of a heavy co-curricular, but really because of anything, then I'd recommend that you actually seek help early. And out of this, I think there are two approaches. The first one, approach the teacher, ask for an extension, and depending on what the situation is and what the task is, you'll probably be granted an extension. Okay, but if it's year 12 and it's an assessment task, then there's all a different ball game. Um, so depending on your t the task, it'll, the extension will probably be granted. And if you need it, I'm certainly happy to help your daughter learn how to do this and to help her do it. The second option, which I actually think is a far better option, is to do the best job you can in the time you've got. It's not about doing the best job you can. Because if you had an endless amount of time, of course you could always keep making it better. But in the end, a really important life lesson that our girls need to learn is to do the best job they can in the time they've got. And so for me, I always say to them, the best alternative is to actually just get that task done. Hand it in, and yes, it may not be the best thing you've ever done, but it's done. If you delay it and you get an extension, often it snowballs. It puts pressure on the next thing that's coming up, especially once they're outside years seven and eight and they have continual assessment in nine, 10, 11, and 12. It actually just snowballs. So I personally think doing the best job you can in the time you've got is a much better approach. But if you need help in any of that, then the trick is to seek help early. I did get a text one night at about 9.30 asking if a girl could get an extension on a task that was due at nine o'clock the next morning. Mm, doubtful, doubtful. Anyway, efficiency and awareness are the keys, I think. Um, and in conclusion, I think if you're doing the best job you can under your current circumstances, then it's the best that you can ask for, really. So kick up your heels and dance. Thanks. So, so far tonight we've heard some excellent advice about rethinking and managing our busyness I've been paying attention to. Practical ways we might come closer to actually experiencing our lives as full and fulfilling rather than just full on and out of control. How can we be busy but not hurried? I'd like to start by reading you a story. Don't worry, it's short. There once was a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were as old as the earth and deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal. Children laughed and played beside it. Swans and geese swam on it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served as keeper of the springs. He had been hired so long ago that now no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches or fallen leaves or debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway. They had roads to repair and taxes to collect and services to offer and giving money to an unseen stream cleaner had become a luxury they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post. High in the mountains, the springs went untended. Twigs and branches and worse muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed. 
Farm wastes turned parts of the stream into stagnant bogs. For a time, no one in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water no longer had a crisp scent that drew children to play by it. Some people in the town began to grow ill. All noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the stream that fed the town. The life of the stream depended on the keeper. The city council reconvened, the money was found, the old man was rehired. After yet another time, the springs were cleaned, the stream was pure, children played again on its banks, illness was replaced by health, the swans came home and the village came back to life. The life of the village depended on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul and you are the keeper. Soul. It's not a word we use much these days, is it? There's even debate about whether such a thing exists, but the late American philosopher Dallas Willard believed the soul is what integrates all the different parts of us, body, mind and will, into a whole being. Even if you see the idea of soul as some kind of metaphor for the inner self, I think it's still a helpful idea. And the suggestion of the story is that giving time and attention to that inner self is what helps us shape a healthy life and what can enable us to live a full life without feeling hurried. In his book, Soul Keeping, John Ortberg says this, being hurried is an inner condition, a condition of the soul. It means to be so preoccupied with myself and my life that I am unable to occupy this present moment. I don't know about you, but that resonates with me because when I allow myself to be overwhelmed by busyness, I feel like I lose my ability to notice things, apart from how annoying everyone else is and how much I wish they'd just leave me alone and let me get on with whatever it is that I think I should be doing, except the trouble is that when I'm really busy, whatever I'm doing, I have this terrible feeling that I really should be doing something else. And I have this huge internal pressure to get each thing done quickly so I can get on to the next thing. Except that ironically, that makes it almost impossible to concentrate on what I'm doing, so it actually takes me longer to do anything. And my mind's always rushing ahead, anxious that I'll miss a deadline or forget something important. That's not who I want to be. I don't want to transfer my hurry and anxiety to other people, especially my family. And I don't want to unconsciously let other people's busyness become my hurry either. And unless I take time to slow down and notice what's going on inside me that's driving my hurry, I'm going to end up doing both those things without even realising it. That whole idea of Sabbath, rest, finding perspective, I believe those things are really important. I always find January is a good time for a bit of reflection. The busyness of Christmas and New Year are over and there's a bit of time without the pressures of ordinary life. This year, my husband and I spent some time in Hawaii. And as well as the palm trees and beaches of my imagination, there was a lot of coarse black sand and hard volcanic rock. They're volcanic islands, so I'm not sure why that was a surprise. One of the places we visited was the Volcanoes National Park, including a large lava flow from an eruption in the 1980s. Lots of grey rock. But here and there, a surprising sight. I find this astonishing. That somehow, sturdy little plants like this manage to push themselves up out of the hard, grey, dusty rock and do more than survive. They thrive, despite everything. Despite the harshness of the environment, despite the conditions around them, they have a source of life that enables them to grow and flourish. I find plants like this fascinating. And to me, this photo has become a bit of a parable. It's the desktop image on my school computer because I want it to remind me to pay attention to my soul, to not allow myself to be shaped by my circumstances, my busyness, the pressures I deal with every day. 
I want to find that source of life and strength that lets me live from the inside out, no matter how full my life is. One of my favourite biblical psalms is Psalm 23. You might know it. It starts like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. It's such a lovely image, and it links with that idea of the stream in the story I read at the start. To be able to live from the inside out, my soul needs to be refreshed, and I think yours does too. We all need to find the quiet waters that will fill us up on the inside, give us peace and perspective, a calm and unhurried centre so that we can take the fullness of our lives in our stride without becoming hurried and anxious. Those quiet waters will be different for different people. But I think the important thing is that we find ways to stay connected to the things that matter most to us, the things that we know will recharge our batteries and help us refocus. For some people, it'll be getting out into the fresh air for a regular walk, maybe leaving the technology at home and learning to be in the moment, alone with your thoughts, perhaps listening to music, yoga, journaling, whatever gives you space to step back and pay attention to what's happening in your inner world. For me, it's a whole package. Trusting Jesus, the Lord who I believe is my shepherd. Taking time to read the Bible and pray and reflect and journal to stay connected to him. Taking time week by week to meet with his people on Sunday at church and in a midweek small group, whether I feel like doing those things or not. Because I need to be constantly reminded that for me, Jesus is the ultimate source of life and peace. The one who said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And as I keep slowly and imperfectly learning to live my everyday life out of greater inner peace and rest, I find myself less hurried even when my life is full. I truly believe it's worth the effort. Well, thank you, everyone. That ends the formal part of the evening. You may have some questions. We're very happy to answer your questions.